Okay, so this video may be just a teensy bit overdue. Oh well. Anyways, welcome back to another video. Today we'll be revisiting the Snakebot, which is a Twitter bot that plays Snake. For certain game mechanic explanations like tie leniency and how the bot is controlled, I'd recommend checking out the previous Snakebot video, where I go into more depth about the bot's origins, development, mechanics, as well as that game's strategy, Pisces. Here's a super quick recap of that video. I found a bot made by Polymars, and I started posting memes directing players on how to play, while using Discord to relay our strategies in real time. On the 6x6 board, the maximum score to reach was 35, and each attempt brought us closer and closer. In the last video, I outlined the game that came the closest to beating the 6x6 board using a strategy called Pisces. Due to unfortunate circumstances, this attempt ended just shy of a maxed out score. And that brings us back to now. You may have noticed from the title and thumbnail that, spoiler, we won, but you might be wondering how that happened. Did you literally just repeat Pisces over and over until you won? That's kind of boring. Maybe you should have come up with a more fun way to play the... Where was I? Oh, yeah, no, we didn't do Pisces again. Not because we didn't want to, but more so because we literally couldn't. Oh, I'll get there. So, our story picks up right around where the last one ended. The Pisces snake died, and Polymars was looking to buff the game, since he thought it'd be too easy to win in its current state. But how does one buff snake? I mean, mechanically, there's only so much you can do to change it. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the board we nearly maxed out was 6x6. Six six. This board size allowed us to draw strategies that were infinitely looping, meaning if you just followed it rigidly, eventually you would win. But what do you think would happen if you changed the board size? Well, changing it to an 8x8 would result in the same problem, since you can draw looping strategies over that too. So, what happens if you try a 7x7? As it turns out, this board size can also be looped, but the way you loop differs somewhat. In this 7x7 strategy, the purple lines represent a hypothetical path if the apple happens to spawn there, which goes right back to the main path. You can think of strategies like this as having two forms, one where the apple isn't in the hypothetical space and one where it is. In a 7x7, the odds of the apple spawning on the hypothetical space start at a 1 in 48, since apples can't spawn on the head of the snake and the odds of the apple spawning on the hypothetical space could be mapped by this equation, where n is equal to the number of apples consumed. This equation does kinda break at a max score, but um, I don't think we'll need it past that point, so that's okay. Anyways, what we can glean from this is that if the number of tiles on the board is even, then the self-looping strategy is always possible. On the other hand, if the number of tiles on the board is odd, then the loop will need to be a little more complicated and require a hypothetical path. With this information in mind, Polymars changed the board size from 6x6 to 7x7. This does mean that we will probably not see a maxed out 6x6 board ever, unless Poly just decides to revert it back one day. But if you think that's where the buffs to the game end, you are sorely mistaken. Polly wanted to keep updating the game while he could, so he made it so he could just update things mid-game. No more waiting for the snake to die for random things to happen. One such instance of a random thing happening was the appearance of the trans snake. This was a manual edit from Polly, but this wasn't actually the first time he messed with the bot like this. Although I couldn't find the original tweet, Polly manually edited the snake emojis to fit the theming of a devil. While this was purely cosmetic in the moment, this was the first introduction we would get into what are now referred to as special snakes. Yup, that's right, there's more game mechanics to introduce. These special snakes were added in one at a time as buffs to the game, making it harder and harder to coordinate. The first snake, as I hinted before, was the Devil Snake. The second post that had this snake was not at all cosmetic, and actually changed the gameplay up. The simplest way to explain its mechanic is that it just moves in the opposite direction of a vote every time, except in the case of a tie where it just moves normally. This made telling people where to go a much more involved task, as you couldn't just leave people with a list of moves for the next 12 hours. Now you had no idea if you needed to tell people to like or retweet in 30 minutes. The next snake introduced is everyone's favorite snake, a glutted snake. Simply put, if your snake turns glutted next to an apple, and then you eat the apple, you die. This meant that many early game routes would actually have to account for potential escapes to glutted. Many people who weren't familiar with the snake would draw routes that without glutted would be valid choices, but with glutted became far more risky to take. Also, as you approach the endgame, the need to avoid potential glutted snakes diminishes since the odds of a glutted happening overall decrease the fewer apples you have left to collect, given your frame of reference. The third and final snake to be introduced was the 
the charged snake. The snake turns red and then proceeds to move in the direction of the vote until it hits a wall or its own tail. That does mean you can hit your tail or the wall next to you in charged mode, which essentially acts as a cancel to the charge. Many people took a lot of convincing to believe that this mechanic existed, even after I talked to Polymars personally and confirmed it. A bit of a sour thing with this snake is that you could potentially charge into a corner to try and get an apple, but then get glutted. Yes, that actually happened, and yeah, the Discord was about as upset as you'd imagine they'd be. A few final things to note about the special snakes is that they spawned at a 50% rate, although each special snake had an equally likely chance to happen out of that 50. As a result, any given special snake's chance to spawn was 1 in 6. Something else significant about the snakes is that the snake head that appears whenever you eat an apple, referred to as yum mode, prevents a special snake from happening. That means that every time you were able to eat an apple, you were guaranteed to be able to move regularly from the spot that the previous apple was. And now, the only thing I'd really need to mention before I can begin talking about the game is why the special snake's chance of happening actually ended up reducing from 50% to 25%. The reason that happened is because something really unbelievable happened. We saw 12 special snakes happen in a row. 12! If that doesn't sound impressive to you, hopefully explaining the math a little does make it more impressive. Think of the snake as having two equally likely states, regular and special. Since they're equally likely, they both happen 50% of the time. The likelihood of getting any two particular snake states is 1 in 4, or 25%. An easy way to visualize this is by writing down a list of every possible sequence of snake states. Since there are only four possibilities, all equally likely, then each sequence happens 25% of the time. You can keep expanding this list for as many moves as you want to track, and dividing one by the number of potential sequences will get you the odds of any particular sequence. Since there's only one sequence that can be written where all of the snake states are the same, the odds of getting however many snakes in a row is equal to one divided by the potential sequences. But how do we find the potential sequences? Well, it's quite easy. Since the odds of a particular sequence starts out at 1 out of 2 for 1 move, and then goes to 1 out of 4 for 2 moves, and then goes out to 1 out of 8 for 3 moves, we can conclude that the total number of sequences is equal to 2 to the power of however many moves you are tracking. So the odds for getting 12 special snakes in a row is equal to 1 over 2 to the power of 12, which is less than a quarter of a tenth of a percent. A lot of people thought the code was bugged, but uh, nope. Turns out that was just a real lucky streak. This long chain of special snakes did cause Polly to reduce the odds, since he didn't really want a repeat of that whole mess. So that takes care of all the major changes to the gameplay that happened, but before I start talking about the game, I should probably make a note here that there was a lot of, uh, lore? I think? I'm not gonna go too far into it, but here's an extremely brief introduction into some snakebot lore. After one of the snakes dies, someone on the Discord says they want to name a snake after the people who post memes most frequently, which as mentioned in the last video included me, Uber, and Mem. The snake was subsequently named Poober, which, as juvenile as I wanted to be considering the name, I didn't think would be very nice given it was literally named after me. So the name of this snake was fine until Mem noticed that their username wasn't included in Poober in any capacity, so they were just like, okay, I am now become evil. And so throughout a lot of this game, someone who helped a ton to get the near-perfect game became became an antagonist. People took it way too seriously. <laughs> yeah. The more absurd a name got, the more discourse there was around it. Even Pro Snakers came up with the Sagittarius strat where we just ran into the top right corner because of Oliver. Uber, who was the second person Poober was named after, was both not a huge fan of people's dislike of the name, and also wanted to add lore, so they spent a large amount of time doing some strange stuff expanding an Uberverse, with characters like Evil Uber silencing the normal Uber. If you don't know what that all means, no worries, neither did Uber. I was, I think I was like thinking way too ahead of myself at the time, I, I was thinking far too ahead, so I just like cut it off. And uh, so remember when I said that you would be disappointed in the end? I was planning on Rick rolling. Anyways, you might be wondering why all of that was relevant. Well, what if I told you that all of that was happening during the winning game? Yeah, Poober was the snake that beat the game. Well, kind of. It, it's complicated. But yeah, this game required me and some other members who were a bit less well known to step up to try and secure a win. So with all of this turbulence happening, both in the form of buffs to the game and some complicated stuff on Discord, you might be wondering how this game actually turned into a successful story. Well, I think it's about time I elaborate. Without further ado, here's our successful game. 
This game starts off simple enough. The major changes in this game are just the board size being a 7x7 and the new special snakes changing up the gameplay. This game was shaping up to be a pretty ordinary game, but things were far from ordinary. Partway through our opening, Polymars decided it was once again time to shake things up and cuts the board into a 5x5. Five five. I was actually getting my hair cut when this happened. So I got my snake notification, I went to check it out, and then I just see that it's 5x5 five five and I'm but yeah, I was like really surprised when the whole 5x5 five five thing happened. Probably freaking out as well, like inside myself. This definitely made strategizing awkward, as we had to scramble for new ideas quickly, but we eventually settled on this loop, nicknamed Bunny. At the time, we all just kind of assumed that Polly was starting to get a little sympathetic to us, since we kept losing game after game after he buffed it, so he shrunk the board to give us a chance at winning. This portion of the game was kind of interesting. You may notice us not going immediately for the apple each time, and that's because our Discord is coming up with alternative paths so that a glutted snake doesn't mean death each time. After collecting apples for a bit, we we start doing a little bit of the bunny strategy, but as we approach the halfway point of our second loop, which would leave just one more apple in the corner, Polly Mars does a little bit of trolling. Okay, well, that stung a bit. Moments from victory, Polly decided that the 5x5 five five was too easy after all. Well, whatever, right? We have a huge head start on the 7x7 seven seven board now. Even with a substantial anti-snake resistance from the name of the snake, we'd still managed to get this far. Something that I've learned about Twitter is that rash decision making is what it does best. Let me explain. At this point in the game, a strategy was drafted that would be similar to Pisces and Bunny. A loop. The strategy in question was named Arceus, since it kind of looked like the Pokemon? Kinda? Anyways, we wanted to set ourselves up for Arceus, since we saw that we were getting pretty far into the game already. But again, this game is unpredictable because Twitter votes for each outcome. So here we have a charge snake. Remember, you can cancel a charge by running into a wall or your own tail, but the movement directions shift from horizontal to vertical or vice versa if you don't tie. So in this situation, we could cancel using our tail, but our options flip to left or right, which results in a death either way unless we can get another charge. We can cancel using the wall, which requires a tie, or we can go up and completely ruin our si uh, of course that's what Twitter picked. Are you mad? But wait, did Twitter cancel this charge? No, they blew it. And of course, now people were all, OMG, the apple's in the corner we were just at. How could we have prevented this? Okay, so tactically, this is probably one of the worst moves we made this game, but definitely not the last time I'll make fun of Twitter for making rash decisions. So now we have to collect the apple in the corner, and so we make our way over. Using yet another charge, we grab the apple. Making our way down, we charge yet again into a corner. For some reason, we decide to finally do a charge cancel here, and perhaps the only position where using the charge would help us avoid doing some unnecessary ties. Doing some digging, I found that there was someone in the replies who was telling people to cancel this one, which was both worse in the long run and ran the risk of getting a blooded snake where we couldn't do anything. Generally, ties are pretty difficult to pull off, and with a growing player base that didn't know how to play and a substantial movement to kill the snake, tying was seen in this game as a last resort. So anyway, here's a sick quad tie. You might be thinking, whoa, how much were people freaking out that they could get this? And to be honest, not at all. This is a pretty large portion of the kinds of comments you'd find on moves from around this time. At this point, Uber was still helping direct the game somewhat, so even with a pushback, we were still in control of the game. Our strategy from here was to do some looping around the border for as long as we could. Since this apple spawned in the middle, we had to do some awkward maneuvering to grab it. It definitely wasn't planned to look like this, and since the next apple spawned on the side again, we just thought, oh, people will probably just want to go around the perimeter again. But then, nope, hard right turn into the apple. I don't know. I can't express enough how worried I was that people were going to try and go down here, but thankfully Twitter didn't like that much strategy. But now we were in a bit of a pickle. To get out of this position, we have to go all the way around up top, tying four more times times in a row, assuming a charge didn't come to save us. So I prepared a few memes to get people ready for this whole mess. Posting where I could, I spread the word about the maneuver we'd need to pull, and luckily we pulled through. From here, we attempt to continue around the perimeter when, uh-oh, Twitter forgot the Devil Snake is sneaky and reverses your directions. Well, this is an awkward position, but hey, notice how this kinda lines up with Arceus? Well, our new strategy here was to resume Arceus, but to ignore this weird little bump we made by accident. And so, off to work we went, and we kinda just made it work for us. Once we made it up top, the Discord works out a cool path that allows us to avoid death in case of a glutted snake, which is a lot harder to do than you'd think. When coming up with strategies, we usually just throw a ton at the wall, list pros and cons of each path, and then take the one that seems to lead to the best outcomes, which takes a lot of debating to the side. 
So to wrap up that tangent, there's a lot more work that goes into routing each apple, and Twitter can decide to warp that path at a moment's notice. Why this long tangent? Well, Twitter once again broke Arceus, which meant we had to once again redraft the method to get back into Arceus. This gets harder to do safely the longer the tail gets, and this was no exception. That said, we did manage to pull back up into that corner. Unfortunately, we once again failed to get back into Arceus. Space was running thinner and thinner, but we still pressed on, eager to pull off a perfect Arceus loop. We use Arceus' alternate route to grab this apple, and now we have to leave a hole here in order for the loop to continue working. In a way, leaving this gap here is part of why this is harder than our previous strat Pisces. Pisces was a strat that went over every square, every loop, and it worked because the board size was even. Now that we have an odd board size, it's physically impossible to draw a loop without one of these alternating spaces. Anyways, I say this strat is harder since leaving an intentional gap is not very easy to convey to most people. What I can say is that my voice held a lot of weight as a community leader, and so when I said to Ty, people listened, and thank goodness for that too. Now we're aligned for Arceus again. We'd finally be able to finish the game. Everybody was getting excited now, readying themselves for the end, following Arceus. And then we failed to tie at the bottom, and died. Wait, I thought you said you beat it. <laughs> yeah, huh? I did say that, didn't I? Let's go back then. Here's something you, the viewer, should probably know about the snake community. We have a hard time letting go of our failures. Equally, we've cooperated to achieve that which we've never thought possible. So when the game reached out for help, we couldn't refuse. This was tie or die. Okay, that compilation might have run just a tad long for a few moves, but it really does capture something in the community. A spark reignited that was fading before. Many were hopping on board the snake hype train to make the perfect game a reality. People who were against the snake earlier like Mem had some time to come back to direct other games, and our propaganda force was in full swing. Everyone was generally just hyped. I'd say there was peace in the snake community for a little bit because it was something that everyone had to focus on. First things first, we eat the skull of the snake that died. Very typical in a game of snake. 
Next, we make our way into the corner, this time filling it out completely. This was it. With a small adjustment to the end of Arceus and some convincing for the public, we'd planned on using this strat to fill in the corner and we'd end the game along the left wall. This was it. Everything was in place. The final hurdle was this apple. Anti-Snakes desperately wanted this to fail, and decided to try and rush this final apple, which wouldn't necessarily kill us, but would force us to do another full Arceus loop. They hoped this would diminish enough hype to allow them to get an upper hand on another tie. But then the charged snake saved us from having to worry about them. We made it to the corner safely, and now all we had to do was collect our apples and hope we weren't glutted on the way down. One, two, three, and after a short maintenance break, four. We did it. So, what did Polymars have planned for the ending of the game? Well, nothing. Actually, that maintenance break was just to buy some time so he could make a one minute video and then throw the link on the last move. In it, he thanks everyone for playing and congratulates the community for pulling together to make the game happen. I'll leave a link to the video in the description below if you want to go watch it. It's actually pretty sweet. After the game, Polly sat in a VC with a lot of the community leaders and we just sat and talked about how the game went. Then he proceeded to make a cryptic teaser with us in the call and had us help him make it look better. We decided that since Polly wanted to have the snake off for five days, the snake should be in a five. And then someone in the call joked about adding an Aperture Science logo, so he did, but very faintly. The image I've been showing has a lot of contrast so that it's visible. Anyways, Polly must have gotten impatient since he deleted the teaser after a little while and started the bot up again before the five days were up. Lots of people theorized that the Aperture Science logo that was just added as a joke was a teaser for portals, and then it later manifested into actually happening. In the weeks that followed our perfect game, word spread, and it solidified itself as another niche internet success story. Even going as far as making it onto that Twitter account that used to be moments that precede legendary events. Lots of people were curious about the story of that game, and there hadn't really been a real explanation for all of it up until now. Hopefully, it was worth the wait. The bot itself is currently down, and has been down since February due from what I assume is dwindling interest. Although, don't think we don't see you, Polly, on your test account getting trolled repeatedly. Okay, maybe it'll be back, but at the moment, the future's uncertain. But you know what? I think if ever there was a time to bring the bot back, this might just be it. I noticed a huge spike of interest in my last video out of nowhere, which meant a lot more of you ended up finding out about this little saga, which is cool. Also, unrelated but kinda related, I noticed like 99% of people who watch me now are unsubscribed, so if you want to support the channel, I'd appreciate it if you did. You can always change your mind later. I've got more of these kinds of videos coming, and trust me, I'm not out of stories yet. Anyways, where was I? Oh, yeah. Lots of you have found out about the snake from me and my retelling of events. But you know, I think it's about time for another story. And when it happens, I hope you'll all be there along with me for the ride. But <laughs> that's all for now. Thank you all for watching, and take care everyone. Peace.